I wrote this world down on paper, and it is all that I have. I've kept a record of the blows to the head, the words that you said, and the paper lights I have seen in the sky that fell to the earth and died. This is not solid ground. It trembles and shakes when you step down, and if you've ever been to a paper world, you know what I mean. When you walk around, you fall. Fall onto paper knees that buckle beneath the weight of your legs. Paper necks snap beneath heavy paper heads. Oh, snap. Paper clocks tell incorrect time. Paper skyscrapers scrape the skyline, and all the city citizens want what paper needs. Strength, strong stock, safety from water, but it all comes pre-tattered, bleeding, confetti-sized drops of pale ink that stain the paper streets. And I wonder, how do you keep a smile on a cutout face? When at any moment, fire will ravage Earth and space, reduce your planet to ash if you bump elbows with a cigarette or a smoking campfire log, get chewed on by a dog that thinks you're the news. I have long since stopped getting the blues. There is no color here, only the absence of light. That's what white is. That's what white is, right? But if you are a paper doll too, then I shall know you on sight. And if you are with me, then come with me tonight. I will match up our bodies by the tears in our arms. We will form paper barricades against matchstick harm. I will make paper love to you for as long as I can in this shreddable world. I will be your paper girl. And if rage is worth nothing on paper, and I have nothing left to say, but if the greatest words of all of our ancestors have been saved to this day on paper, on paper, clinging for dear life to paper for God knows the reasons why, then I will write this on paper and send it up to the wrathful 2D God in the sky. Make me a lover to burn with, and I will be the one who burns it all. I will do your bidding with a smile. But before the cinder sparks and the great fall and the fire starts, give me one day, one, and I will make a paper boat and sail with him on the sea, and after that, I will gladly burn down the whole paper world as long as he burns with me. Thanks. All right, so it's Writer's Week, and that is phenomenal and tremendous, and you're very lucky. I mean, I know you're in school, and it's like, meh, and you're probably missing class, so you gotta make up some stuff. But um, not every high school has this, and it's, it's really, it's groovy. I'm a writer, so I think it's groovy, and some of you are just getting out of class just to get out of class, and that's okay, that's fair. But, um, you know, words are very important. <laughs> it sounds so lame, but it's very true. Um, you know, the poets in this world, we don't read a lot of poetry these days. Used to could be when kids were in school and a, and a lot of, and I'll talk about my crazy Russian ex-boyfriend in just a minute, but he, when he went to school in Russia, he was born there, eight years he spent there, and then he came to America. But they had to memorize poems in school and people used to, like you had to, you had to pick a Shakespeare sonnet or longer, you had to pick, you know, I don't know, something really long, a really long poem, and memorize it. And that was part of your, part of your homework, you know, is to memorize a really long piece. Maybe you have to do some of that, but it was, it's crazy. And over in Russia, they still have to do it, communists. Anyway, um, so, so I'm going to do, I'm going to do words for you today. And if any of you are writers later at the end, we're going to have time for questions and answers, and I'll answer anything you want. And you can ask me more about my crazy Russian ex-boyfriend who drove me here this morning. Bad idea. I was crying. I was crying in the car at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> so why did I let him give me a ride? Stupid. He wants to get back together. Not gonna happen. All right, like in a million years. But he looks at me with those big brown eyes and that like, he's not, he doesn't have a Russian accent, but he says the wrong words sometimes. So like he would help me with my suitcase and he'd be like, uh, I'll get your briefcase. I'm like, sweetheart, it's a suitcase. I love you so much. <laughs> Please stop being crazy now. No, you're not going to stop. Well, all right. So, so I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm going to tell you why. It has to do with him. But anyway, but this is the poem I wrote when I left Chicago. I lived here for like 14 years, and I love it here. I lived in the city, and I love it here so much. It's like a lover. It's like I love it like a person. And I left to move with him to New York. Anyway, I'll tell you that later. This is the poem I wrote about the day that I left. It's about that. It's short called June 1st, 2014. We sped down LSD that day, the train giving way to a taxi drive. Me and my luggage were whisked away about a quarter to five. Through grimy windows, my eyes did see steel and glass buildings standing so sure 
Chicago is a hard and imposing city, but its heart is pure. What have I done to my favoritest lover? Leaving like this, my purse grabbed in haste, off to new visions and a new city's cover. What a waste. For mercy and grace, I shall grovel and beg, come June when the weather is fair. Lash at my back and the backs of my legs. It proves you care. There you go. A little something. Um, all right, so next I'm going to read a piece from this book. I don't have many of these. I have like seven of them, and I'm selling them, and I don't want to take them back in my suitcase because it's very heavy. They're $12, and in this book, I'm going to tell you what it is, is my essay, and also J.W. Baz, who is a brilliant genius, is performing. We're doing every other... Um, episode every other period throughout Writer's Day today. And so he's backstage eating a sandwich. And um, his, his piece is in here too. And what this is, Wright Club is a show in Chicago. And uh, it's at a bar, so you can't go yet. But when you're, when you're of age, you can go. And now like the show's like in Atlanta and San Francisco and like Canada someplace. It's, it's awesome. And what it is is two writers compete. Two writers are, are chosen by the people who run the show. And you're given a week ahead of time. So you get an assignment a week before the night that you go to battle. And what you're given, so two writers are given opposing ideas. So one writer will get rain, and one writer will get shine. Or one writer will get top, bottom. Yes versus no. And that's the only prompt you get. That's all you get. So you have a week to figure out a seven minute piece about how you're gonna defend the, the one you got. So if you got top versus bottom, let's say you got yes versus no, and you're yes. So you have to like fight with your words and your writing, however you choose to approach it, why yes is better than no. Like say yes to life and da da da, however you wanna do it. You could say, say yes to like the McDonald's chick who asks you if you want more barbecue sauce, like however you want to do it. Yes is what you're defending. No is like say no to pain or say, you know, however you want it. You get the idea. So the show is amazing and it's packed and people are drinking whiskey and so it's really raucous and crazy. And, and, and the winner is judged and if you go over time, they go ding, 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 ah, and so you can't finish. So part of the, it's a hard game to play. Part of the thing you gotta do is write your piece, rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it, so you get it under seven minutes because you do not want to get dinged. <clears throat> so I did this show a couple times. Baz has done it a couple times. We crushed our bouts. I'm just saying, I'm just saying we won. I'm just saying we won. And um, I got, the last time I did this was uh, foreign versus nature. Or sorry, foreign versus native. And one of my good friends, Chloe, we were like against each other, and I crushed her. I crushed her. <laughs> Sorry, Chloe. Love you, mean it. And um, so I'm going to read you my piece. It's called about foreign. I had to defend foreign or like win with foreign. So, <laughs> <clears throat> go wildcats. All right, here we go. We go wildcats. Roots versus branches. There's Santa versus Jesus in here. It's really good. Oh, yeah. I'll read you what there, what's in here after I get done. Okay. And I'll sign it for you, all that good stuff. Foreign. <clears throat> you can't choose your birthplace, your native land, but you can choose the out of where you want to go. You're from Modesto. <clears throat> you live in Rome. You're from a family that traffics in burnt ham and thinly veiled hate. You practice patience and serve fennel most delicious. You didn't learn that at home, did you? No, you did not. A foreign agent was introduced at some point. A stranger, a new strand. A foreign idea went viral in your native, previously static brain. Often this sort of thing comes from a book. And we all know a book opens like a door. Well, foreign comes from the Latin foras, which means door. What can possibly be accomplished if you don't open the door? A closed room? What air comes in? What breath? None can come. Perhaps more depressing? None can leave. You stay in one place, you start collecting dust and precious moments fi figurines. Just ask my estranged, senile grandmother, presently mellowing in her Texas nursing home. Oh, this is all true, by the way. Like, this is all true to my life. Okay. Uh, she's dead now, my grandmother. It was about a year ago. Anyway, so 
Uncool, TMI. Ah, uh, just ask my estranged, senile grandmother, presently mellowing in her Texas nursing home. I'm glad she's in her native city of Houston. That's surely a comfort to her, being there among familiar faded church bulletins pinned to familiar beige walls. Of course, if she had gone to Dubai, instead of staying and marrying the first man who gave her a moment's notice back home, she might not be gumming bland, pureed carrots right now. Oh, it might be carrots. It's, she's 90, it's gonna be carrots, but it might be curried carrots. And if it were, if she had eaten more curry over the course of her life, it might have aided her digestion, which, is, which curry is believed to do. And this would have ultimately benefited her DNA, which would have been passed on to my dad, who likely would have married a different woman than my mother if he had gone to Cordoba instead of also staying in Houston. And sure, I'd be a different Mary, maybe with more almond-shaped eyes tooling around muddy side roads in a beat-up gremlin looking for work, but I'd probably be singing to a newish, quality American pop song, and I would likely not have spent four days in the hospital last week, as I did, due to complications from a disease I think I got from my grandmother. Undoubtedly, I'd have a different set of problems. We are all unhappy in our own ways. But to be rid of the pathogen that developed naturally, hereditarily, natively, if you will, in my abdomen, well, I'd roll those dice in a banana leaf minute. I have ulcerative colitis, by the way. That's what I'm saying. All right. No, you can't choose the places, uh, you can't choose who your natives are or where you're from, but you can choose the foreign places you go. And if you are a serious person, aware that you are here for one shot and one shot only, with no do-over, no eternal party to look forward to, if you're nice, if you are soaked in the reality of this lovely and shatteringly painful moment that you have chanced upon, entirely owing to a foreign object entering your mom's, you know, Word to your mom. Uh, if you are alive, good people, you want to go, and not just go on. You want to go to Perth, or Venus, or dinner at the new place, and you want to go now, and go farther, and go away, and go big, and keep going. Keep going. I know, it's fucking hard. It's so hard. And then what do we do when we can't take it anymore? We get out. We throw him or her or it out. We welcome the door, the for us, hitting us in the ass. We wait for it, the door hitting us. It's pragmatic. It gives us the extra push. We escape to a foreign place, kick, click through to a plane ticket purchase. We pack a change of panties, a phrase book, or nothing, or a noose, or a set of shiny new razor blades. Oh, yes, we leave. We have all kinds of ways to go. Because what is foreign, while it is uncertain, indeed, and risky, of course, and frightening. Yes, what is foreign is better than what we know. We do know that. The foreign is better than the leftovers in the fridge that never get any fresher, better than the preset radio station that insists <clears throat> on being the same gesture away from the steering wheel day in and day out. It's better than the same old cereal flakes, the same worn satchel, the same old you, regardless of profile pick. What's unknown is certain to be better than the objects in our native habitat, <clears throat> the chair, the chair, the chair. Familiarity breeds contempt. I hate you. I hate you, you chair. You bore. You constant cracked milk pitcher with the flower motif on the side. You moth-eaten closet of dead-eyed dresses staring at me again. You standard typical native beasts. I'm gone. I'm gone. I'm leaving and I'm not coming back with the same eyes. It would be impossible once I step out and meet the foreign skies and the rearranged figurines on the street. I cannot come back the same, which is to say that I will never come back, which is the goal a new version of ourselves. That's what we want, what we eternally want. It's what we want when we buy. It's what we want when we drink, when we answer the ad for used furniture or new love, however used up that may reveal itself to be. Our desire to be foreign to our very selves is in every haircut, every diet change, every catalog course we select, every new job we take, every current endeavor for business or pleasure, every date, every first kiss in any high school in Chicago tonight any night, every night of the same old seven day week. We want what we don't have. It is the drive of our species. From the sea average sorority pledge to the lettered scientist, make no mistake, that scientist, she's in the lab as we speak, introducing a foreign agent into the dish. Tomorrow is a brand new day, they exclaim cheerily. Why such confidence? Because tomorrow is foreign. You just don't know. What hurt you on Monday, Mary? Well, it might may, may not be so bad on Tuesday. You don't know. So get up, sunshine. Carpe diem. Carpe tomorrow, mofo. Tomorrow. That's not mofo in there. Tomorrow is different, foreign to us and fresh. Forget the congenital native today and its attendant malaise. Who needs it? Nobody. Nobody needs it. I am proud to meet every dawn a foreigner. It's tomorrow that we live for, the foreign nature of it the strange that gets us out of our creaking, musty, 
painfully native beds. Yeah. So the audience cheers, you know, and then it's, it's based on like audience uh, cheering level. So, you know, it's like, okay, give it up for like me and Chloe would get up after we both did our things. And the host is like, okay, give it up for Chloe Johnson. And like, yeah. And he's like, mm, give it up for Mary Fonts. And I beat her like just this much. So it was pretty close. It always is because these writers are some of the best writers in Chicago. And it's, it's way cool. And I actually think, I'm sure Baz and Shelley would agree with me, um, and probably Ms. Schoenbeck as well, um, you guys should do this. Like there should be a high school program where you do this. Or at least, I mean, I know the guy. I know he wouldn't care. Ian, who created this show. It's so fun, like to do this, and, and students I think would love this. It's like love versus hate. It's a fair fight, like hate is way better than love, or love is better than hate, you know. So you could fight it out, it's pretty good. Um, so, this crazy Russian, hmm. Well, I'm in DC, I live in DC, and anytime I tell somebody that, they're like, how did you end up in DC? Because apparently people think only people who are in House of Cards live in DC. <laughs> It's not true, I'm not in politics. I lived in Chicago 14 years, and I, I, I wanted to buy Bitcoin. You guys know what Bitcoin is? Bitcoin? Some of you? Come on, some of you, right? Yes, no? Oh, gee. Well, it's the future of money. <laughs> it's internet currency, anyway. And so I wanted to buy some of these, and so I went online, and I figured out that you buy these Bitcoins on your phone in person. So I found this person who had like a really good rating from the people who had bought Bitcoin from him, and I, I met him at the Board of Trade one morning, and he was like way younger than me. He's 27, I'm 35. And I walked up to this guy, and it was like, oh, this kid is cooler than I will ever be. He had like this cap on, and like glasses, he was sucking on a smoothie, and he's like, what's up, he's kind of a bro. You know, and I was like, hey, okay, let's do this transaction, no big deal. And I walk away, and he had my number because we were texting, like, where are you? Okay, <clears throat> I'm over here by the Chase Bank, whatever. And so he texts me as I walk away, are you single? Are you single? And I was like, ah, what a cheeky young man. Yes, yes, I am single. And so we went out to coffee, and then we went out to dinner, and I have a hot tub on the top, on the roof of my building, so we may have taken a hot tub together. And I fell in love with him. I fell in love and he fell in love with me. And he was this younger man and he had abs, it was amazing. And so we fell in love and then he got this great job in New York City. He got a, a job at a Bitcoin startup and it was a dream job. He's like, I gotta take it, you gotta take it. And I can work from anywhere. I work on the road, I do these kinds of things. I uh, make quilts and so I teach quilting on TV, on PBS. Some of you may have seen me teaching. Yeah, you've seen me? Oh, you sneezed, <laughs> you sneezed. I thought you were like, yes, I've seen you. I've seen you on TV. <laughs> Uh, I should have seen you. I should have seen you too. Um, and so, but I really am. I really do that, and it's cool. I mean, I gotta earn a living. So I quilt and I write. That's what I do. And maryfons.com if you want to know more. And um, so I got, so I work from anywhere though. So he's like, baby, come with me to New York. And I'm like, baby, okay. And so I moved to New York City. I rented out my condo to be able to afford all this. I rented it to these medical students from June to June. And I went to New York, and it was a disaster. Oh God, oh it was so bad. I hated living in New York City so much. I think to go to New York you gotta be like a kid from Ohio who's like, I gotta move to New York City. Or you gotta work in publishing or fashion, a place where you have to be there. I didn't have to be there. So I was walking around like furious all the time. Like what is wrong with you people? Why do you live in this city? It's so crowded, it's so dirty, it's so noisy. Like I, would, I was practically biting people. I saw this woman with her baby like in, a, in trash. Like she was trying to get to her door and like kicking trash away and her baby. I was like, get your baby out of here. What are you doing? It's a child, get, go, to, go to Montana, just breathe air. Breathe real air, not dirt from the hobo who is, I saw, oh, we called him Spider-Man because he had a spider web tattooed on his face. And I'll tell you something, this isn't funny and good, but it's true. He, would, he was always laying on the, on the ground in the East Village where we lived, and there was always some kind of liquid draining from him. Vomit, urine, God knows what. I don't know. There was, it was terrifying. I was like, I, this is terrible. I have to get out of here. Then I broke up with him, with the guy, not Spider-Man. I didn't go there. I thought about it. I mean, he's a very original man, but no. Um, so no, I, I, I had to break up with uh, Yuri because it was, it was not good. Things were not going well. So there I was in New York City, hated the city. Maybe it's because I'm hot. Um, this is why I'm hot. I'm wearing a jacket that makes me hot. This is why I'm hot. I freestyled last period. I, I, it was the first time I'd ever done it. It actually went pretty well. Maybe I'll do it again if it's a request. Just letting you know. Anyway, so, so I broke up, this is way too long, I gotta get back to what, 
you're paying me to do here. But anyway, um, in New York, hated it. Relationship over. Can't get back to Chicago till June, because I have tenants. And my best friend's like, I know what you should do. Get out of New York. You can't go back to Chicago, so move someplace you've always wanted to live. Where do you want to go? You can go anywhere. And I was like, DC. I love DC. I lived there for a month when I was a neo-futurist. We toured this group I was with, this writing performance group, and I lived there for a month at this, working at this theater. And I loved it then, so I moved there. And I love it now uh, for a lot of different reasons. So that's how I got there. And, um, and it's weird, but now I'm thinking of staying. So my blog, Paper Girl, at my website is all about, uh, the post today is about that and how hard the decision. It's like I'm being pulled between two lovers. I don't know what to do. It's like a bad lifetime for women movie, my life. Um, so here's, here's a poem, a sort of about a breakup as well. Um, and it's not this one, but it's a different one. All right. Well, what did you suppose would happen? Between laundered shirts and autumn days that vie to be the crisper, between your sleight of hand holding my manicure, between a pink handbag to match my dress and the kind of man you are throwing the kind of woman I want to be into focus, between kisses so tender on the nape of my neck, what did you expect? Our hearts are different vintages. Yours, you age well, you wait for the polished shoe to drop, I am green. I still allow my eye to glisten with the steam that powers hope. I am led by the nose that is hooked to a rope that is hooked to my heart. She knows no obedience. And our lines on our faces are maps the clock puts there. The forehead shows the path of the first worry. The cheek charts the hardest years. Laugh lines are easy landmarks, but beware fatigue at the corner of the eye, my son. It belies the optimist gaze. I can spot a broken heart in a happy man a mile away. And maybe more lines on your face is what you were afraid of. Or maybe my touch was getting too soft. Or maybe I'm not pretty enough. Or maybe it's some other girl. But I do not take kisses lightly. The smaller and softer they are, the more weight they carry. When we met, I asked you to be careful with my heart. Fool! I wanted danger! Would have fired the guards and told the watchman to go, but no, you took me at my word, and for the first time in my life, I hated being a writer. Between sleep and laughter, between barbecues and catastrophe, between June and October and the process of giving over, I fell into you and didn't expect you to pull away so soon, so I still see you in the silver spoon that stirs my tea, still, still wonder what you didn't see in me. Chalk it up to timing, laugh it off to friends, a pillow clutcher once again, practicing a smile in the front it feigns. I loved you, and it remains. Thank you. Love is so hard. That's the theme today. The other folks who are performing are talking like writing and like inspiration, and I'm like, Boo, love is hard. And actually, I'm going to write a poem on the spot for one of you in just a moment. But before I do that, very, two very, very short pieces by Dorothy Parker. Does anybody know who that is, that poet? If, I'm here to tell you, especially you ladies, um, she's amazing. Dorothy Parker is dead. But she used to be alive. And when she was alive, she wrote poems that would blow your mind. She was so dark and so depressed. And she drank all the time. And she smoked cigarettes. And she was like, Bleh. And she wrote really great prose. And she wrote for Vanity Fair. And she wrote uh, criticism and all this stuff. She was amazing. Part of the Algonquin Round Table, too, which is this really hip hip cats back in like the 20s and 30s and they were just all these fabulous writers that got together and anyway, they're mythologized like they were these brilliant people that all hung out together and it was kind of true but anyway. Um, but Dorothy Parker wrote these short, usually rhyming poems that you can memorize so easily and like recite them in your head when you're going through stuff. I'm a nerd, I do that. But uh, like for example, here we go. This, this is a Dorothy Parker poem. The sun's gone dim and the moon's turned black for I loved him, and he didn't love back. That is it. Yeah, pretty good. I didn't write it. Don't applaud me. It's Dorothy. OK, and then, so how about this one? Um, Once when I was young and true, someone left me sad, broke my brittle heart in two, and that is very bad. Love is for unlucky folk. Love is but a curse. Once there was a heart I broke, and that, I think, is worse. Now you can clap for that.
Is it true? I mean, if you've ever been dumped, it's pretty bad. But if you dump somebody else, oh, it's, it's really bad. So, okay, for this next, for my next trick, uh, I'm gonna need uh, two um, volunteers. And I had two gentlemen last period. So I would like at least a girl and a guy or two girls. So, anyone? Yes, ma'am, you right there in the glasses. Yep, you, 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 come on down. And you, my dear, come on up. Okay. Welcome them to the stage with a round of applause that helps cover, you know, their entrance, we call it, in the theater. All right. I'm coughing, man. Okay, so what's going to happen? I'm going to do something called the Insti Poem, which okay. is uh, where I write, careful now, okay. uh, I write a poem on the spot for this person. Now, would you, hey, you're a poet. I You did a great job. Oh, You did a wonderful you. job in uh, third period. I did. Very nice, very nice. Okay, so I'm going to have... <laughs> You, and I love what you're wearing. Those are fabulous. Oh, thank I you. I really love them. Okay, thank so you. you are going to interview, uh, what's your name? Nikki. Nikki. Nice to meet you, Mary. And what's your name again? Georgia. Georgia. So Georgia, you are going to interview Mickey. Okay. I'm going to write that down. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to write a poem for Mickey right now, using the information that I get from your interview. And um, the, the only thing I can tell you is that the more information I get, the better, the easier this is for me and the, more, the better I can do it. I'm sure you'll have no problems, but okay. sometimes I ask people and they're like, what's your favorite, uh, where'd you get your shoes? And then it's like five minutes later, they're like, what's, what do you like to do? <laughs> and that's hard. So just yeah. breakfast, okay. uh, favorite, yeah. favorite places go. You got it. You got okay. it. I don't get to tell you this. Okay, uh, go. Okay, what's your name? My name is Mi Michaela Rose Yukas. Okay, what's your favorite food? My favorite food would probably have to be corned beef and cabbage. What about your favorite color? Uh, blood red. Do you have a favorite shirt that you like to wear? I do not. Okay. Well, what's your favorite season? My favorite season is fall. Um, hmm. What's your favorite subject? My favorite subject is foreign language. What was the question? What's your favorite subject? Great, great, great. Foreign language. What foreign language do you take? I'm taking Spanish, but I'm learning several other languages on my own. What other languages? I'm teaching myself Japanese, Russian, Italian, and German. Impressive. What do you want to be when you grow up? When I grow up, I want to be a diplomat in the Marine Corps. Oh, that's really cool. Um, what do your parents do? Um, my father stays at home, and my mother is a systems programmer for the government. Do you have any other brothers and sisters? I have an older brother who is uh, in the Marine Corps, an older sister who is going to college, and my oldest sister uh, is currently with us with uh, her husband and two children. What did you do for spring break? Over spring break, I went to California to see my brother. Was it fun? It was very fun. All the questions I have. Uh, Do you no, need more? Not done. Oh, no, okay. No, no. I'm you sorry. More questions. Uh, a few more, like two or three more. I'll uh, end this interview. <laughs> um, duh, what do you like to do in your free time? In my free time, I like to learn. Learn what? Everything. Okay. My legitimate goal in life is to know everything. <laughs> Do you play instruments? Yes, I play the oboe. Uh, Percussion. You do know everything. My God. <laughs> I feel like such a loser right now. <laughs> I play the oboe, percussion. I'm teaching myself guitar and piano. That's really cool. Um, oh. Okay, I got it. Okay, give them a round of applause. Uh, interviewer, you can sit down. Thank you. Let's sit down here. Hot off the press. As hot off the press as you can get. All right. All right. Now see if you can find all the things that we, she talked about, you know. Hmm. Michaela is Mickey. It's tricky, Irishness. Irish blood red roses in autumn. This language isn't always easy. She's turning polyglot, not easy. And her heritage is as a sister, and one of many. Living with the pack, her tack is into the sails, into the wind. She'll know all by the end. She's her own friend, Miss Mickey. Yeah? Okay. I wrote it now. There you go. Thank you. Round of applause for Mickey.
All right, a little something we call the Insty Palm. Cool. All right, so this one, this one is, oh yeah, this is what I want to do. So, oh, could you bring down the house? Bring down the house. Oh, there's that too. I'm popping and locking in my head with all this material. What am I going to do next? I'm going to do this. So, Baz said something amazing, the other performer, one of the other two performers today, um, this morning, and it just has stuck with me. He said, uh, if you know a writer, or if you are a writer, let's say you know a serious writer, without question, they read more than you. <laughs> because as a writer, like, you can't be a writer without being a reader. Um, if you say you're a writer and you're not reading everything, bull crap. You can't, you can't do it because you have to constantly um, remember that you suck. And you have to get better by reading people who are better than you. I mean, really, like I, that's how I feel, is I'm terrible, I'm terrible, and so I have to read people who are way, way, way better than me. So, for example, like Michael Jordan, okay, Michael Jordan was probably the best basketball player that's ever lived ever. We may see another one in our lifetime, I hope we do, um, because that would be amazing to go to one of those games. I was too young when Michael Jordan was playing. None of us saw Jordan play, but I heard he could fly, you know? I mean, that was the thing. People said he could fly. He could fly through the air, basically. So he was amazing, and most of us, well, all of us, will never be as good as him. I mean, we won't, sorry, but we won't. I don't even play basketball, I don't even know what ball that is. So, uh, so, so but, but if you strive to be as good as Michael Jordan, and this is not inspirational, like rah, rah, you know, inspirational speech, but if you strive to be as good as him, if you're a basketball player, you're going to get further by just trying to get there and falling short than you would be if you were just like kind of inching along on your own. So having these heroes is really good for whatever you do. And doctors, you know, inventors, things like that. So as a writer, I looked at the people who are so great. Most of them are dead. <laughs> but like Philip Larkin is my favorite po poet. I have a little picture of a dog. I don't have any pets because I travel too much. I can't keep a pet alive or even a plant. But I have this picture of this little dog that I found at a flea market. And his name is Philip Larkin. And he's my little dog. And he's like, mm. And I look at him when I come home and I say, hello, Philip Larkin. And so Philip Larkin, he's dead, and he was a poet who was in England, and he wrote these really good poems, and he was very dour. Dorothy Parker is a, a, you know, a friend of mine. And, um, and T.S. Eliot, and you know, these greats. And so I read them, and I say, yeah, that's what I'd like to try. So my, poem, my poems have adapted over time, you know, changed, I hope, to get like them. And so um, this poem is a Philip Larkin poem. And I don't know about you, but I am afraid to die. Some people who have really strong faith in God and stuff, they're like, I'm not afraid to die because I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home and I'm going to see all my family and my pets. And, you know, I don't believe that. I don't know. I don't think that that's true for me. So I think when you're dead, you're just dead. And uh, some people are going, mm, can I tell you about Jesus? Um, don't. I don't want to hear it at all. So uh, I've heard about it. No, thank you. So anyway, um, so f say it again. Oh, thank you. Oh, geez. Oh, God. Okay, so, ooh, yeah. Um, so this is Philip Larkin. He says he wakes up in the middle of the night and he's afraid of death. And so he writes this poem. I sleep, I drink all day and get... Sorry. I work all day and get half drunk at night. Waking at four to soundless dark, I stare. In time, the curtain edges will grow light. Until then, I see what's really always there. Unresting death. A whole day nearer now, making all thought impossible, but how and where and when I shall myself die. Arid interrogation, yet the thought of dying and being dead flashes afresh to hold and horrify. The mind blanks at the glare, not in remorse, the good not done, the love not given, nor time torn off unused, nor because an only life can take so long to climb clear, clear of its wrong beginnings and may never, but at the total emptiness forever, the clear extinction that we will travel to and shall be lost in always, not to be here, not to be anywhere and soon, nothing more terrible, nothing more true. This is a special way of being afraid. No trick dispels. Religion used to try that moth-eaten musical brocade created to pretend we never die. And specious stuff that says, no rational being can fear a thing it cannot feel, not seeing that this is what we fear. No sight, no sound, no touch or taste or smell, nothing to think with, nothing to love or link with, the anesthetic from which none come round. Slowly light strengthens, and the room takes shape. It stands plain as a wardrobe, what we know, have always known, known we can't escape, yet can't accept. One side will have to go. And 
Realization of it rages out in furnace fear when we are caught without people or drink. Courage is no good. It means not scaring others. Being brave lets no one off the grave. Dying is no different, whined at or withstood. Meanwhile, telephones crouch in locked up offices getting ready to ring, and all the uncaring rented world begins to rouse. The sky is white as clay with no sun. Work has to be done. Postmen, like doctors, go from house to house. Philip Larkin, there you go. Okay, we have like a minute for a question. Probably two, maybe one question, maybe two. Yes, down here. You, well, it's not quickly. I work and work and work on it, and I write in the morning, and I memorize in the morning. How did I what? Say it. Oh, the Instapalm. I write every day, man. I write in my journal. I write stories now. I've been doing a little fiction. I write all the time. So words are like, my, like I make words, I spank them. Spank them. They're mine. I own them. So I have them. I have a million ready to come out. So that's how I practice all the time. Yes. I'm inspired by everything. That's always a question I get, I don't know. The world is tragic to me and beautiful. I can't stand it, I hate it, I love it, I cry all the time. Baz was doing his piece, I was weeping in the back. We are alive for a very short time. We have to take it by the horns. We have to squeeze every last drop. If you don't, you are asleep and you must wake up, you must. We don't get, a, this is not rehearsal. So life inspires me all the time. Yes, in the back. Oh God. No, I, I'm horrible at this. I'm horrible at this. The bell's gonna ring and ding-a-ling-a-ling -a -ling, and merry, 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 you didn't shave your legs so you hurry, hurry, hurry. This is the end of the poem and the freestyle. Yes, you wanna smile, but you're sad cause you're doing this crap. You're so bad, you're so very bad. And bye, bye, bye to fifth period. There you go. Bye you guys, have a great day.